So now, obviously, if you're going to replace all of these different systems, you have a scaling issue. You have to figure out, especially with a centralized mechanism like that, even just to handle visas throughput, let alone every imaginable smart contract, that's not going to work if everyone's running a copy of every com program on their computer. Yeah, totally. So, you know, if you look at like uh, just the raw numbers of blockchains today, Bitcoin is currently processing some a, a bit less than three transactions a second, and if it goes close to four, then it's uh, already at peak capacity. Ethereum, right? You know, over the last few days, it's been doing about five a second, and if it goes above six, then it's also at peak capacity. So, on the other hand, you know, Uber on average 12 rides a second, PayPal several hundred, Visa several thousand, major stock exchanges tens of thousands, and if you want to go up to IoT, then you're talking hundreds of thousands. And if you're, you want to go up to non-financial applications, so like for example, there's a platform called Leroy, which is basically just Twitter on the blockchain, then you know, you're talking also about hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. So. You know, there is a kind of gap from here to there. And I think right now there already is really a lot of institutional hype in the space and just public hype. So when you have, you know, like Vladimir Putin having, you know, knowing what blockchains and Ethereum are and Paris Hilton going out promoting ICOs on Twitter, you know, that's, that, that's peak hype. But the reason, I think a large part of the reason why a lot of this hasn't materialized into action yet is precisely because of some of these technical obstacles that make blockchains you know, work okay for some niche use cases, but not really work, work well for mainstream use. Now, you know, our team is working very hard on various kinds of scalability solutions. So you hear about buzzwords like plasma, sharding, state channels, write-in, you know, all uh, there's you know various newer ones like Perun. Um, so you know if you you know you, all of these are various different ideas that actually do try to kind of break through this fundamental barrier, right? That try to either create blockchains that still maintain a large amount of security without requiring everyone to literally process everything. Right, so if you think about it, like one extreme is one guy processes everything, which is today's world. The other extreme is everyone processes everything. Well, what if you can get like square root of everyone, so like maybe 500 people processing each transaction? You still get enough decentralization and security for everything you need, but suddenly it's you know within uh, it's efficient enough that you know it actually works for for stuff in the real world. And the, the other kinds of strategies are strategies that try to use the blockchain in a, a kind of more intelligently, right? So it's basically, you, like one of the analogies that like Joseph Poon from like uh, Plasma uses a lot is um, the uh, um, idea of the blockchain as a court system, right? So blockchains are great at securely resolving disputes, and you know, currently the way well, well, like the naive blockchain applications work is they just put every single transaction on the blockchain. But what you could do instead is you could have systems where people send messages um, that I call kind of tickets, so digitally signed messages that are off-chain by default, but where the blockchain only gets used in those specific cases where there's a disagreement. So like if I have a hundred digital, you know, a like hundred ether, and I send you the hundred ether. Then, that, then that might not ever go off chain. But if I send you the hundred ether, and then you claim that I never sent you the money, that, or I claim that I never sent you the money, then that's an, a transaction that I could. Okay, we have a dispute, and I could actually push it down onto the blockchain, and so we still have, you know, a guarantee of security. Now, all of these approaches have their own trade-offs, and there's this huge amount of incremental technical work involved in figuring out what the right trade-offs are. But you know, this starts looking like a direction that's much more promising. And how far along are we? How, how long until you think that uh, maybe we can scale to, uh, as you said, hundreds of concurrent users? How many until we can replace Visa? How many until we can replace AWS? I mean, for th things like Visa, I think uh, definitely, uh, I'll say a couple of years. So maybe one year when we start seeing like prototypes that have you know like a low security level but are still you know secure enough for like major organizations to start just doing proof of concepts on, and a couple more years for all these solutions to really hit the mainstream. For, I mean, AWS is a trickier one because like there are reasons why blockchains are you know no matter how good they are never going to completely replace uh, centralized cloud computing and probably even more one of the big ones well there's probably two big ones in my opinion one big one is that there are computations that are intensive and that are hard to parallelize 
So decentralized clouds are really good at parallelization because you know it's like Uber for your laptop. You know you got you got millions of computers from you know millions of countries, millions of providers, all ranging all from individual laptops to you know you can you can think of you know even cloud computing companies be, basically turning into like specialized mining farms inside of the system. But if you have uh, computations that require like a really large amount of serial computation, then that's harder to decentralize. And the second really tough one is privacy, right? Like if you have computations on private data, then there's basically two approaches. One of them is to make sure the computations are only done on hardware that you trust. And the second one is to use fancy cryptography. So, you know, you might have heard of buzzwords like homomorphic encryption and distinguishability obfuscation to do the computations. But, the, or, but then if you do that, then those tends to carry very serious some um, computational efficiency trade-offs. So basically for private or serial applications, you're going to do them locally? Yeah, like in general, I think like there's obviously, there's always going to be this large set of applications where decentralized approaches like actually don't right. work that that's well and that's sense. fine. Yeah. And so you're, you're essentially building something to be an operating system and a protocol for the world on the fly. It's going to take a decade probably to get to full scalability and, and uh, hopefully adoption. Uh, what do you do in terms of the, there's a classic operating system developer um, uh, question that they wonder about, which is how wide do I go and how high do I go? So do you start adopting other applications into the stack? Do you, you, all these people are doing ICOs, they're building layer two tokens on top of Ethereum. Do you see Ethereum adopting any of their functionalities or does it stay as a broad, wide underlying Yeah, no, like one of Ethereum's slogans right from the start has actually been, we have no features. Right, so like a, lo a lot of the other projects are definitely going in that direction. They're saying, oh, we support this class of new class of transaction for issuing a token. Oh, we support this new class of transaction that issues an ICO. And look, you can have your five parameters with like a, a cap, like period, like type of auction or, or whatever. But you know, with Ethereum, we've never gone down that road, basically be uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is that you, know, you, you want the protocol to be maximally simple because simplifying the protocol just improves consensus security. So you know, the, more, the more consensus code you have in the protocol rules, the more likely it is you'll have issues like two different implementations like not being in sync with each other, leading to the blockchain just randomly splitting in half. Um, the um, other big re reason, of course, is just you know, unknown unknowns. We have really no idea what blockchains are going to be used for like five or 10 years from now. Right? And we don't really want, uh, I mean, we are okay with uh, ma making some specialized components that get used a lot. So like Ethereum, uh, uh, or we have a next update, Metropolis, which is coming in October. And one of the major things that's coming in that is like explicit in protocol support for certain kinds of cryptographic operations. So like um, a, a ring signatures, um, um, elliptic curve pairings, which get used as part of zero knowledge proofs. So basi the major theme here basically being like strong cryptography and privacy. And like that is kind of specialized, but it's also very generic because almost any application could benefit from privacy. So we are willing to compromise somewhat in that direction, but we really don't want to compromise in favor of like, really supporting high efficiency in every single application. Now, if that means that there are specific application categories where some platforms have compute Ethereum, then, you know, that's fine. You know, like we uh, don't need to be everything to everyone. But, you know, there are also going to be ways to kind of specialize even within the Ethereum ecosystem as well, right? So there's like, you know, projects like uh, Cosmos, you know, things like Plasma, all of these are trying to provide second layer systems that connects to Ethereum and in, many, and in many cases are even designed in order to take advantage of the, the base Ethereum blockchain for security. But that can have properties of their own and that you know, if they run well could have you know, things like a, a 500 millisecond block time so you can run StarCraft on the blockchain. So you know, those things are possible and if you adopt this approach where if you have Ethereum as this kind of base layer that you know, it does a, you know, a it does a good job of balancing between the kinds of the like high level of security and uh, the scalability that a base layer needs, and then allows these other things uh, with various different properties to get built on top. Then you know you, you actually can have a blockchain ecosystem that works really well.